Awesome. Um, all good. good morning, everybody. Good morning. Morning. Welcome. Happy Friday, everybody. Good Happy morning. Friday in August already. This is crazy. Yeah. Um, cool. So um, when August is spring going to be here? <laughs> it's already <laughs> getting cold. Uh, <laughs> Um, so welcome to the Proactive Health Collective of Keene. Um, I am Dr. Tisa Abatelli with my partner, Dr. Matt Abatelli. We're with the Cheshire Wellness Center. And we have Allison Millar with Basic Balance um, Acupuncture and Rebecca Montrone with Wondrous Roots and the fabulous Dr. Jean Clarkin with Monadnock Natural Health. So we are your Proactive Health Collective team here in Keene. So yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so awesome. So today we are going to start off um, basically talking about trauma. Um, and trauma can be in the form of many different things. We kind of think trauma more on a physical, um, like I hit my head and had a trauma or I got in a car accident and that's a trauma. But trauma can be more than one way. Um, physical is a big one. Chemical is another, so thinking about the foods we eat, the medications we take, even the air we breathe, smoking, things like that. Um, those can be chemical traumas to our system, like toxicity, and I'm sure Becky and Jean can talk about that. Mm -hmm. And um, another big one for trauma is emotional trauma. And a lot of the trauma that we experience in our life can actually start from a very early age, even in the birthing process. That can be uh, very big for a lot of people and they not even realize it. And then things show up later in life. Um, and they're like, well, I, I have no idea where this is coming from. And it's okay, we don't have to know. But trauma is huge. And right now there is with the COVID-19 situation, um, Trauma is, is, this is kind of an emotional trauma going on in, in the states, in the country, and in the world. And it's, it's really impacting our health. And what lit me up about talking about this today was I heard Bill Mayer, is that what we said? Mayer? Um, Marr. Bill Marr is a commentator, um, a comedian, and he was talking about, you know, how we're actually approaching this whole situation worldwide. And we know that there's an election coming up and that's kind of changing the, how we look at, are looking at this. And what really got me going was that we're not talking about what's really important here, like how to handle trauma and this emotional trauma specifically. We're, we're focusing on the reactive, the way that we have always been. Like I get sick, I go to the doctor, I have a fall, I mend it. And our mindset has always been on the therapeutic response, meaning reactive healthcare. And we are the proactive healthcare collective. Like it's, your health is not just, it, it's not from one person. It's not from just a bottle, uh, a pill in a bottle or a potion in a bottle. It is a bunch of different things. And we are not talking about the things that are most important, which is how to have proactive health, the things, the healthy tips that you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to keep yourself at the best that it can be so that you can handle something like this. Um, we're not guaranteed anything in life and death is part of life and how we get there or what happens up until that point is our responsibility. Our health is our responsibility. So I want to open the floor to my colleagues here and say like, what what can we encourage people to do that's easy and that people can feel successful about and really help them be more healthful nowadays more than ever? Gene, you got to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself because I was whatever. Um, but I was, <laughs> you know, uh, one of our mentors, Dr. Donald Epstein, always would say, um, all of our problems stem from our inability to experience our experience. In other words, we're, we're fighting against the experience, and that is what is traumatic to us. Um, you know, and, and I will say this is, uh, you know, dealing in the realms of both the, that sort of 
oh, you call it mental, emotional, or spiritual place uh, of of acknowledging or or realizing that our emotional traumas play into our physical health, but and also being in the arena of looking at heavy metals and all that kind of stuff, the biochemistry, I can tell you with absolute certainty, you can get all the biochemistry right. And if a person's life is not working for them, if they're feeling traumatized, whatever that experience is, you can never get, you can never get on top of the physical stuff. It just keeps happening. It's like, you'll keep finding new stuff to try to fix. And so it's a really important aspect in how we experience the world. And of course, you know, in, in today's climate, this is huge. It's probably bigger than any other time in history that I can imagine as far as yeah. worldwide. Um, and, you know, down from our children experiencing this feeling of fear, like, oh my God, I have to be afraid of getting close to somebody. I mean, um, and then, you know, the fear of going outside. I mean, people are in like absolute terror of, you know, walking down the street. Uh, so I, I think that does play a huge role and will, I think as we will see it play out in the next, you know, few years here and you know, how things go uh, and how that affects and, and translates into physical health, but certainly our, our experience uh, that we're having. Yeah. And, and the thing is that uh, the emotional things actually do affect the biochemistry. So you can, you can, you know, kind of get the biochemistry, but if you are really depressed because of things going on around you, or you have a lot of anxiety and stuff, it will alter your neurotransmitters. So it is going to change your biochemistry um, directly. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a, when you get into that mode, so there's a lot of, you know, we're paying attention to all these things right now. There's um, the concept of being very vigilant about what we do. Um, and we might say it's a hyper vigilance right now where you're really paying attention um, to everything. And that, of course, is the news media. You know, they're vigilantly watching everything and reporting it back to you so that you know what's happening next. And one of the things when we look at, the, at physiology is that without a foundation of both awareness and um, well, whatever that is that you have in yourself that remains centered. Um, without that awareness, a hypervigilant state turns into panic state in the system. There's really, it's a fine, fine line between hypervigilance and panic. And that P word, I mean, that's, you know, you look at people who get stuck in these um, sort of survival situations, um, whether it's wartime or just lost in the woods or whatever else. Um, and the number one killer of any one of those is panic. People panic. Um, and then that's when things happen. And we are looking right now at an entire culture that is right, really like riding the line between being hypervigilant and paying attention, being aware um, on all levels and sliding down into panic, which is when things start to go sideways. I'd like to really give a, 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 quick, a personal example, okay? So years ago when I started my business, I went into a building that was um, the landlord was like a real estate agent. He was, they were in the same, it was like an old historic building. And um, his wife also worked there and she hated me from the minute I got there. And she was like, the day we had our open house, she, she just, I walked by and she just called me the B word. I mean, it was, it was really hostile. Okay, so she had problems. Um, but I mean, I was like, I, I hated, I felt like I knew what a kid felt like going to, getting on the school bus or going to school who was gonna be bullied because she was really like, one time I was talking to her husband up in the thing and she comes running up the stairs and shakes her fist in my, in my face, right? So when I would go to work and she, her car would be the only one there in the morning, I was like, it was just a horrible feeling. And I'm feeling that way now, like with the passing of this ordinance, cause I'm like, I'm supposed to be wearing a mask when I come into my building here and I'm getting on the elevator and is somebody gonna judge me about that? Is somebody gonna be angry with me? I'm not gonna wear a mask here in my office, but now it's put on me this same sort of feeling. I, I mean, I actually had to get, I got cameras because of all my tinctures. I'm like, she's in the building. She could walk in there. She could put poison in my tinctures. So I actually put in surveillance cameras, right? And, and it was this horrible feeling of dread when I went to work every day. And I think this is something that we, we're really imposing on the population to a great degree. 
and it's wrong and it's, it's so unnecessary and it's not helpful. Health is much more than the absence of disease. It's the body, mind, spirit. And all we're doing is going about germophobia. We are gonna make people so unhealthy in every respect. It's, it's devastating. So for our audience, maybe, because I think a lot of us maybe in our training understand you know, from our different backgrounds how trauma affects us in the physiology, but maybe a lot of people that are listening have no idea what we're talking about and how that could translate. Does anybody want to share in their discipline what, how that might translate? Well, really quick before we, before we kind of go into that, I just want to kind of point out and to tie in with, with what Matt was saying with panic too. When you talk about trauma, it can be mental or physical, and they both are an external thing sort of coming at you. So a big piece of the puzzle is resilience. You know, if you're having physical trauma, it makes sense to us that if you have a stronger body, if your bones are stronger, then it's not going to affect you as much. But I think that a lot of the time we forget that it works the same way emotionally. You know, if you are in a state where your mindset's not great, maybe you're not doing the self-care or for whatever reason, you're just kind of not on your game or your whatever's going on there, it's going to affect you uh, more strongly too. So, you know, again, pro being proactive about your health can, it's just the same emotion and physical. And that's so much Chinese medicine too. When we look at trauma in Chinese medicine, it's, it's different for every person depending on sort of where the influence has gotten them. And generally speaking, trauma stagnates our chi in our blood, but different people, depending on where they're at or what organ systems are in balance, it's going to affect them in a different location. And so that will be affected. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, isn't that like, you know, trauma, isn't that stress? I mean, we have uh, PTSD is something that we started hearing about, you know, you know, a few decades ago, you know, mainstream, and obviously it was known well before that, but now it's a pretty common thing. I mean, I have people that come in all the time that tell me that I have PTSD because of this, that, or the other thing. So post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, so that we can basically diagnose the fact that the body is in a state of arrested development because of something that happened. So we have baked into our neurology a fight or flight system. In other words, if you encounter a stressful situation, one that could be, um, you know, uh, let's just say you encounter a predator on the landscape, you know, whether that's an animal or other, and you have two choices to either fight or flight to get yourself uh, past that situation, you go back to your resting baseline, which is a healthy state. But if that threat perpetuates over and over and over and over again, what will happen is it will become habit habitual, and then that's that hypervigilant state which then starts to lock in the physiology it actually something that continues such as a uh, social situation during a time like this or whatever depending on what our outlook is will lock itself in the physiology the body will develop a post-traumatic stress disorder which is basically a sign of trauma and what that means is that your neurology thinks that it's still that time so make no mistake, the virus attitude will persist long after the virus. And this is one of the scientific reasons why. So the more we can understand this and this topic today, the better armed we're going to be to grow into something new because one of our uh, mentors likes to say, post-traumatic stress disorder. He says, how about post-traumatic growth disorder? Like, what are you gonna turn that into? It's really an opportunity because it's nothing more than compressed energy and energy is meant to be used. It sounds very similar to the stagnation that we talk about, like the, it just kind of freezes things. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess in your sort of language, it probably freezes it in the, the nervous system, right? In the, the spinal cord, is that right? Throughout the entire physiology. So nerves tell muscles to move and muscles move bones. So it's in the musculature, it's in the fascia, it's in the immune system, it's in everything going, you know, Gene, like you said, right off the bat, you know, you could have all your biochemical processes perfect, but if the body's still locked in that, like, it's not going to get better. So yeah, Allison. Yeah. And I'll just mention real quick, uh, you know, off of what Allison said, 
the strength, <clears throat> but I also think flexibility mm. is really key. Um, and, you know, if you're thinking about a sport, you know, if a football player goes out without being flexible, boom, he's going to get injured, right? Um, and the same thing is like, if we're so, I use examples like, well, no, dinner is supposed to be at eight, not at 8.05. And how I lock my structure <laughs> to to be stuck in that place where it's like, yeah, eight, nine, whatever, anytime you Mr. want. Mr. Banks. And, and, and <laughs> yeah. so flexibility and strength, I think, you know, in the same way, really, you're talking about building resilience, I guess, would probably be a, a good word for that. Yeah. And I yeah. wanted to piggyback on that from Allison to Jean to this is, and that is where nutrition plays a big role because um, these stressors really devour our vitamins, you know, our vitamin supply, especially like the B vitamins, super important to make sure that we're replenishing nutrition because uh, that really does help us be resilient. Uh, so glad you brought that up, Becky. It's like, if you're in the trenches, like you need to have all hands on deck, like nutrition, nutrition, supplementation, like don't, don't miss this one. Yeah. It's yeah. so opposite of our natural instincts. When we get stressed, it's like, you, you feel like you need to almost put more on your plate and you got to be working through lunch and you got to skip lunch because you don't have time for it. And that's, it's the opposite. Of either, that, or, or, yeah. either that you got to devour a, a gallon of ice cream, you know, <laughs> <laughs> dark chocolate. <laughs> yeah, chocolate's good. It's good for the brain. Get your antioxidants in there. Endorphins, yeah. you know. <laughs> And you know, it's interesting with, um, I always used to say, because I have, I have an understanding and a background in nutrition. Um, I, I don't specialize in it, but I do have a degree in it. And I, I always, you know how we always used to he hear you are what you eat, you know, like whatever it is that you put in, that's how you're going to be. And then I started learning the chiropractic principle, knowing that your nerves, you know, control and coordinate all processes and where tension is makes a big effect. And so I started to realize, well, you are what you're able to digest because if your system is not functioning, you're not yeah. gonna digest the good or the bad, you know, and your system, and it's gonna show up one way or another. And, um, and the body is, is amazing to adapt to the best that it, it can, especially when we're stressed out. And I think people, tend to go the easy route right now when right now, you know, we've had a global pause for a very long time. And yet there's been so many opportunities to learn how to cook something new, learn and try out a new um, exercise regimen or get interested in maybe doing something meditative. It could be something as, as easy as, you know, starting to draw and just doodle or um, play an instrument or meditate, you know, there's so many opportunities. And I think that's what's being missed in this whole pandemic. It's just like, because all it is now is wear a mask, social distance, wait for the vaccine. That's where we're, that's all we're hearing right now. Not, hey, if you're really struggling right now, here is a very easy, quick meal that you can make. It's super nutritious, super nutrient dense, and it's really easy and your whole family will like it. Like here's, a, here's that example, you know, and that's an, or you've got time, you're home right now. You know, you see the jokes of, of on YouTube and Facebook about the little dogs singing about how families are home now and they're very excited that they're going on like five walks a day because everybody is quarantined, you know, and I don't, there was a really cute example of it. Um, and uh, and, and the people are outside more because they're quarantined, but now that we're going back to society, we're creating that stress ball response again, the fight or flight that is perpetual. And now we're going back into the same regiment and still listening to the news and still hearing that negativity. And so we're not shifting anything, like not much has changed. The fear is still very, very real. And um, I really think that that we're missing a tremendous opportunity to to change from the the reactiveness to the proactiveness i want to just really touch quick on the physiology here a little bit so people can understand this <clears throat> so first of all in the fight or flight we you know when we're getting up to run and you know or being attacked our resources need to be used in a way where the blood supply is going to our extremities our heart rate is increasing blood pressure cortisol levels we're ready to go and then say we go to digest a meal or heal, 
we don't need all that. And so we slow things down, bring the blood in from our extremities. And so it's a matter of like where we're allocating our resources. If our, if our resources are allocated in survival all the time, there's no, there's nothing left for growth and healing and repair and, and dealing with all the stresses we have. But the other thing, and, and I know uh, Dr. Sabatelli will um, you know, be right in line with me on this, our brain works differently. So in those resources, the frontal cortex, which is where we experience love, creativity, what's my purpose in life? Wow, it's a beautiful flower. It's where we can take in this, it, all this stuff that's coming in and process it and deal with it and sort of categorize it and, and adapt. And when we're in a stress physiology, your body's saying, well, right now, it's not time for love, creativity, and what's my purpose in life? I, don't, I can't deal with that. And so it actually disconnects in a way or withdraws resources from the frontal cortex, which would be where you would adapt to stresses and things, right? It would be where you would be able to say, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of stress in the world, but I'm okay. And so we're in that survival mode and we don't have access to the resources, then everything else that comes at us feels more traumatic because we don't have the resources to access. If you've ever like had been in a relationship and, and somebody wanted to talk, I, I just can't talk about this right now. What you're saying is right now, I don't have the resources to be able to, to have this conversation because I'm in fight or flight because all I have access to is my, is my reptilian survival brain. And so not, you know, I think what you were saying before, Matt and Tisa also was where we experienced this this event that happened, it's still happening. And so from a physiological standpoint, we're still experiencing that event. And so we, we're still having the, the, the lack of resources and lack of ability to adapt to future events based on that past event. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> so. there's, certain, there's certain things that happen physiologically when you get in that. And so there's small types of body hacks that you can do to sort of counter that. Like for example, um, where you look. So if you're focusing your vision really close to you, that's more of a survival state because when you're hunting, you've got to see where's the danger around you. So if you focus your vision out on a horizon, it'd be great if there's some nature out there, but it's as far out as you can kind of see it. That's one thing that can kind of reprogram your brain a little bit to get more of a calm state. Um, what else is one? Uh, breathing. So if you if your exhale is longer than your inhale, that calms your nervous system. I've heard lots of different things about breathing in and out through your nose or your mouth. Matt, you know about that stuff, right? Is it one of them is like calming? Yeah, I mean the most calming is just the in the nose, out the mouth breath. Um, that will access the horizon part of your brain versus like, so think about the horizon as being like a, a wide focus, right? Um, and that otherwise we're tunneled in looking at one particular thing. So nature is a great example because you can look at an animal like the owl who has, you know, the great horned owl's eyes are so big, they're literally just like stuck in the sockets. They can't move them like we can. So they have to turn their heads all around. We have those great photos. But the truth is that they're always in this big peripheral vision. So they're always in that horizon mind. And then when they see movement on the landscape, then they tunnel in very specific. When we're running the fight or flight, we're always tunneled in. And if you're always tunneled in, like you're saying, Gene, it runs a different part of the brain. And the breath for that is a nose, nose breath. So nose, nose, breath is the mind. So if you're tunneled in on one thing, I guarantee you, unless you have some sort of obstruction up here, you're breathing nose, nose. So a quick way to just switch it is to in the nose, out the mouth. Hmm. And then um, I don't think it's Ayurvedic or different yoga teachings. They'll do the um, alternate nostril breathing. So like inhale, exhale, and then inhale, exhale. And that's supposed to be really calming as well. It's a good way to balance the hemispheres of the brain. Yeah. So um, to build the neural connections between the two hemispheres, which, you know, women have much more of those than men. Sorry, guys, it's true. Um, but we can work on that also. Um, so yeah, one nostril than the other. And what's interesting is that if you find that, oh, I can breathe really easy here, but then nothing happens over here and then really easy and then nothing happens here. It's actually showing you that half of the brain is not online. And we can measure this <laughs> um, neurologically. We can actually measure this in the tests that we do in the office. But I mean, just you know, simple stuff. But um, it's really interesting to see. And then what happens when both hemispheres of the brain are online, where you have the analytical, you have the creative, that's when this starts to happen. And then we start moving toward resilience. Incredible. It's all connected. 
All right, so I, I have to share this, okay? So I had to go to DMV yesterday to get my, oh to get my license, yeah. renewed, which, which expired on my birthday, May 5th. So <laughs> I had to make an appointment and wait, it was August 6th. So I go out, I think the DMV is out by the liquor store by, oh, I get there and I get up to the door and oh no, it's moved to Emerald Street. So I'm already, oh. you know, so I'm Good to know. feeling happy. I'm feeling some anxiety stuff. And so I did the breathing. You know, I breathed in through my nose and I exhaled slowly and it did nothing for me. So somebody's going to need to teach me about that. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was, I was like, this is supposed to work. Well, the other uh, thing that, <laughs> that you have to incorporate in that is, is your focus. It, breath is, is an important tool, but it must be combined with where you're focusing your attention. That's really key. And, and I think, Allison, you were telling me you're reading The Power of Now, right? Mm-hmm. And that, you know, so there's one of my favorite books. I read it cover to cover at least 35 times. I just, it's sort of like, you know, soothing to me and I take it in. But one of the things that he suggests in the book, and this is Eckhart Tolle, is that as a general practice, not just when you're in the traumatic place, because it's more difficult then, but when, when everything's okay, really practice being present in the moment. And when you touch the glass, how does it feel? And what's the temperature? And as you lift it, and what are the sounds around you? And as you walk down the stairs, how do you feel that on your feet? And when you get in the car, what's the smell? And what is the feel of the steering wheel and the sounds? And like really paying attention to every, every detail. And, you know, I think one of the things that for me and I, I, is that you, you can only really have your attention on one thing at a time. Mm. And if you have your attention on the moment, you can't have your attention on the anxiousness, anxiousness which is the future moment or the depression, which is the past moment. You can only really be experiencing this moment. And when somebody says, well, I am experiencing this moment, I'm depressed, they're not really, they're still in the past moment. So that's an exercise that you can do along with your breathing, but really any time of day, like everything you do, every place you go from one place to another, whether you're getting into the car or going home, you can really take that as a sort of walking meditation and and practice that and i promise you if you continue to do that then when the traumatic times come becky and you're in that anxious situation you have you sort of like have a, a neural pathway already created that you can go there and be in the moment but i think i do like i mean i'm like this morning i'm the kind of person i'm like i have a toothbrush and toothpaste how wonderful I could take a shower. This is great. I fed the critters and it's wonder. I mean, I'm really, that's how I live my life. Right. But I'm just saying when this moment of anxiety came, I was like, all right, let this breathing do its thing. Maybe it did. Maybe it would have been worse if I did it. It's was... a really good example though. It's great to bring that up because we've all had moments where we felt like that. I always say that when I get those moments, I feel like I'm, I know what to do, obviously. Like, and uh, I feel like I'm shouting at myself underwater, like breathe in the nose, out the mouth. And it's just like, blah, 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 blah. like, yeah, okay, good luck with that. Like, you know, and, um, and there, it, because what happens is that when we're in those um, extreme moments, that fight or flight, that all of the resources are going down to that, you know, like you said, Gene, that reptilian brain. You know, so we have access to, like, we don't have access up here anymore. We're running a totally different program. So in that moment, you could look at, so what would be resourceful for the human operating system during that moment? Well, obviously not trying to have like some higher, um, you know, thought and meditative moment where like, oh, like peace in front of me, peace behind me. Like, no, 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 no. Like you're already running your emotional system. Like your limbic system is in like overdrive now. So if you cultivate intelligence, and you understand how to work with that within your own body, you actually are starting to step toward being able to work in a much more primal way so that when stuff does go like chaotic, you can you still have access to something that's going to be able to serve you and those people that are with you. Yeah. And network spinal care really is a training process that you go through, really, if you think about it, that yeah. you get to learn these strategies in your body. Yeah, thank you, Gene, it's very true. Oh, and I want to say something about that because um, I've been doing this network spinal care with um, Dr. Zabatelli and uh, it's just wonderful. Like just even when I just like walk down the hall to use the bathroom, I'm like so much straighter. Like my shoulders are, it's, my shoulders are back. My pelvis is, I just feel like I'm standing taller and it's not like, 
or, or I want to stand taller. I don't know if, what it is, but it's like the combination of, but. I, I want to share an experience too about network. Because, you know, I've been practicing network and, and receiving network for over 20 years. Um, and they, we have these seminars that we go to that you get a lot of work done in a weekend. And actually, I think, Matt and Tisha, you have a, a clear day coming up? Or? Yeah, we do. We have an immersion coming up a week from tomorrow. I think we're on a wait list, but it doesn't hurt to get on it. Anyway, but, you know, in this type of a situation where you really immerse yourself in that, I remember this, uh, I went, this experience, I went um, to a gate, they call it a, a transformational gate, and um, came home, and it was a, it was like a Monday night, had gotten home that day, and it was in the middle of the night, I woke up somehow, you know, like something woke me up, and then I heard two cars coming down, like racing down the street, and I heard a big crash, boom, and I went out to see that two cars were racing down a pretty thin street with cars parked on both sides and, and the crash happened to be my vehicle that they crashed into and then they took oh. off. And so I went out there and I looked at it and was like, oh, all right, well, I guess I'll call the insurance company in the morning. You know, like normally that would be a traumatic experience. Like, oh my God, my car, look what happened to this guy. And it's like, okay. And you know, cause I was just in that moment. I was like, well, okay, there's nothing I can really do about it. It happened. And the next step to take would be to call the insurance company and just go through the process. And I did it. It never really caused me any stress. And, and another, in that time frame too, I remember if any of you have been, been around Atlanta, they have these like six lane, you know. It's roads, eight now. Eight lane roads. <laughs> I'm driving and, and uh, I'm in the, like the next to the, uh, next to the left lane is a lane. And there was an exit over like right to the, my right. And somebody cut me off like bad like to get over to the exit and I remember this thinking and I'm driving I was just like and I reacted and I didn't you know I'm from New York too so and normally I'd be like ah! but I, I didn't even like react at all and I thought to myself what the hell is wrong with you because I was just in such a state <laughs> so you can get yourself there I mean there's work that you can do Hello. that proactive way you know like you're proactively working on this when you're not in the traumatic state and when you get there, it doesn't seem to affect you as much. And I think there's something also that sticks with you for your life. Like when you've reached those depths, like yeah. you never quite go all the way back. You really do own it. It's a beautiful thing. And it's not to say that you're never going to ever experience something that is traumatic, like being frustrated that you thought the DMV was at one place and it's now at another place, you know, like it's not saying that you're never going to have that, you know, or, or this is designed for you to not feel that kind of stress. No, you're still going to feel it to some degree. It's how you handle it. Like I tell people all the time, they're on the table and they're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm normally really upset about this. And, and today I just, it kind of happened and I was okay about it but normally. And I was like, it's how you hold it afterwards. Do you let it roll off your back or do you continue to hold it? And it's teaching. No pun intended. No pun uh. intended. <laughs> exactly. So, and that's the idea. It's the same, it's kind of the same thing with, you know, like what Allison does. It's like the balancing of the chi. Like if the energy is stuck or the, the chi is stuck and it's, and it's creating tension, it's just, you have to balance it. But it's not to say that you're never going to re react or respond ever in a traumatic or frustrating situation. No, you still need that and you'll still have access to it, but you're not gonna live with it and hold on to it, like and for five and hours later. Right, huh? and those emotions are there, you know, to protect us as well, Yeah. You know? but it's just the, the, the <clears throat> balance. Now, I have to, this is kind of like more personal, but I'm very curious. So, um, Jean and Matt and Tisa. Okay, so when I go in for an entrainment, I'm thinking you guys are like, you are putting out your energy constantly. I mean, you're focused, you're going from one person to the next and their whole physiology is all different. And you're going from one to the next. I would, find, I would think that would be absolutely exhausting. Can you comment? Is it? <laughs> it could be. It can be. <laughs> <laughs> it was at first. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, uh, what do they say? The sheer act of trying negates itself, right? Um, and the truth is that what we do is that we simply remind your physiology um, how easy it could be. And that's really it, you know? And it seems so simple, um, but it, it's like it's self-regulating. And there's something about being in the company of... So, 
being in a company of healthy people, you know, the first ingredient in any healthy community, so listen up people, <laughs> the first ingredient in any healthy community is healthy people. So take a look around, what's your community? You know, we, we say, if you wanna change the world, go home and love your family. Like who, what do people need right now? Do you have people in your family that aren't doing well? Like what is it that you can do to create the healthy people that will bring about the healthy community? And I can tell you, and Becky to your question, is that when you are in healthy community and we are blessed because of the work that we do to be surrounded by healthy people all day, every day, is that it will carry you, it will carry you and it will be effortless because of that. It's energizing. We leave more energized than we show up every single day because we're just <clears throat> as dynamic as you are. Yeah, I think it, it comes down to like, if you're, if you're not in your flow, it can be very challenging because it does take a lot of mental focus for there's things that I do that in the office that are, you know, crucial to getting to some certain, you know, underlying things that are going in the body, but they really don't take a lot of mental focus for me. Whereas when you're working with somebody and applying network care, now you're talking about you, you're having to connect with them. You feel what's going on emotionally, feel their tone. You're paying attention to a lot of things at one time and being very specific in your, not only your application, but your, um, how you approach that person. So there's a lot, there's just a lot of self-awareness, but like anything else that grows and becomes part of your normal nature as you do it more. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I guess, you know, it's like, never forget where you came from. And yeah, there've definitely been times where, you know, if the focus isn't there and it, I, I think the amount of, you know, like time and effort is um, directly related to your amount of presence. You know, so that when you have a lot of presence, when you're very, very present in the moment, like what you were talking about, um, Allison and Jean being you know, super present and being in the now. And then when you're right there and you're with that person 110% and there's nothing else, then it's, it's really, really easy. But if, you're, if your mind starts to wander to the future or the past, which is really all that it can do if it's thinking and talking at you from the inside, it does get more challenging. Yeah. And, you know, as you bring that up, it makes me think about it. Like if you're having a conversation with somebody, you're in a relationship with somebody, and you have a conversation and you're trying to really connect, which is what you're trying to do with your care, right? You're trying to connect with that person. And I'm having a conversation, but yet I'm like flipping through the channels or looking out the window. I'm not present with that person. I'm not going to have much of a connection. And so as you're applying network care, network spinal with somebody, if you're not present, it's going to take you longer to really get that connection. And so you could double or triple or even quadruple your work. Whereas if you really are focused on that, what you're after, then it comes much easier and faster. So, yeah. And I they say it's, it's not a, it's not an energy exchange. It's not like we, yes, we are, our, our energy and our state is very um, important into how it would affect the person on the table. Um, but we're not transferring energy. So I'm, if someone's on the table and is having a bad day, I'm not taking that on. And I'm not also not putting my energy on them either. It's, I think Reiki is more of that kind of exchange of energy. I could mm -hmm. be wrong, I don't know. But, um, but I feel like that's the difference. Yes, it's energy work, but it's not an exchange of energy. It's, it's a, a field of energy because people are in the room together. And that's why it's called an entrainment because, <clears throat> It, the energy flows through people, but it's not like it's in a negative or, or a positive way. It's just a different, it's just elevating the whole entire field in a, in a different light. Yeah, that's a that's really good distinction uh, because it's, there's no yeah. conscious exchange of energy. No. This is chiropractic versus like an energy healing um, you know, discipline such as Reiki, which um, is incredibly dynamic, um, where there's a conscious exchange in that case. It's just one example of many. Right, so it really it's measurable and it takes care of itself. I wanted so the to mention field, as the field lifts, it, it lifts <clears throat> us. So, I wanted to mention one thing that uh, Matt you had mentioned real early on in this conversation about, um, you know, so we experienced this traumatic event. What was the growth opportunity there, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, oh my God, how can I get away from this? How can I avoid this in the future? What what did I learn from this? And one of the things I think that, um, in in speaking, because we're we're talking on this level <laughs> of energy is that from a vibrational standpoint, we experience a trauma and we hold that in our body, right? We hold that experience in our body. And in order for us to, to, to clear that, 
we have to kind of revisit it. We have to go back and bring our attention into it. And, and it could be said, and, and a lot of people will theorize this, that um, because we're holding that particular vibration, we will continue to attract that situation back to us so that we can have the opportunity again in the future to address this that is within us. And if we don't address this within us, if we continue to like guard against it, then we will continually get the opportunity over and over and over again in our life until we do address it. Right. Don't worry. The universe is very forgiving. If you don't get the lesson this time, it's going to give it to you again and again and again. It's so exactly. true. And I want to mention that just because a lot of times, because it's in the, in the mindset and how we approach things. Mm. And if we're looking to get away from everything, or if we're looking at an, as an opportunity, if we understand that it can be an opportunity and that it really has something to do with us. In other words, when you date the same person over and over again, hmm, I keep finding that same person who she does this and, oh, it's like, well, maybe it's me. You know, like I keep attracting the same situations in my life. And if you really look back at your life with a discerning eye, you can notice that patterns until you've sort of figured it out and resolve that. And then you don't have to repeat that anymore. And then maybe you move on to the next thing. Right. It never ends. Next, but, I think, but I think the concept here is that the more you ignore that, the louder the signal gets and the more disruptive of your life it gets. Mm. And to the point where it could be so disruptive that it, you leave the planet, right? Right. Like Tisa, like you said, like you are what you're able to digest, right? You are what you're able to digest. So yeah, if you, if you can't, it's going to keep running the show, you know? And the thing is like, what I would like to say is that you don't have to figure it out. You know, like the healing journey doesn't mean like going back and figuring out like why this happened and like going like through all that stuff. Like it's an instantaneous state change in the physiology. Because in that moment, you have enough bandwidth to be able to digest it. Like, you don't have to figure it out. That's exactly what, where I was thinking too. Like, it is important, as Dr. Jean was saying, to, to sort of be present with what it is. Otherwise, it, maybe it'll keep coming back or you have to deal with it. But dealing with it doesn't have to be a mental thing. You have to do that to incorporate your body to deal with it too. And my patients will sometimes you know, especially people that go to therapists or counselors and they go a lot. And I think there's so many different, you know, types of practitioners and counselors, but sometimes what I feel like it's like uh, the analogy, like you're taking all the crap that's in your closet and now you're just bringing it out into the living room and you're not doing anything with it. It's like all this mental stuff, you're thinking about why this happened. And it's just this like whole cycle, but you're not at any point incorporating your body how do you move this physically out of your nervous system right yeah, and at that point oh go ahead gene yeah real just real quick is i think that's a key because i'm thinking in the language you know that we are thinking in, yeah. in in our philosophy is that dealing with it doesn't mean mentally playing with it it means going into the where it's anchored in your body and experiencing it or allowing yourself to experience it allowing yourself to bring attention to what you're holding against not necessarily having some mental story about it because it's probably just a story anyway right? My favorite. Point, go ahead matt yeah well i just wanted to say that i I, th I think you can't um separate trauma from pain you know we can't because so pain is anything that stands between you and the magic of the moment pain is anything that stands between you and the magic of the moment period it doesn't have to be like my hip hurts or i have a headache it can be any state, including a hypervigilant state, including the inability to digest, including being stuck in a loop with a certain practitioner, anything at all, you know, it can be, that can be pain. So it's designed to interrupt your life. That's what we say in the office anyway, you know, that pain is designed to interrupt your life. And the reason that we say that is because if you don't get the message, <laughs> it's just going to stick around. Like going back to what you said, Gene, you know, it's like, don't worry, you're going to be able to like do it again and again and again and again. And eventually like we'll get that, that insight that we need to be able to move on. And Alice, you're talking about the closet. I love that because all the stuff's in the closet and we just want to like take it out and throw it all over the room. And meanwhile, like a state change is like, it's all around the room now that we just did this, but like, oh, look at that. It's a sunny day outside. And then realizing that there is, the door is open. 
oh, okay, walking outside. I mean, by the time you're like, you wandered through the yard and you're past the apple trees and you're down by the creek bed, you think you're gonna remember what's in the closet? Like, nope. <laughs> it really does work like that in the physiology. Yeah, opening up a door. Yeah. yeah. And I'd just like to wrap up that story about that woman. Um, Ooh, good. Yeah, but it all ended up, I don't know if it was a year and a half later, but um, there was a death of, of another agent in the building who, her, her husband. And so this woman who hated me knocked on my door to tell me about it. And basically we became very good friends after that. So, wow. yeah, so it had a happy ending. It did have a happy ending. <laughs> You know, just a quick note on the pain thing. Uh, Four-year-old Seamus, cli always climbing up things and whatever. And, and he would climb up and we have the gas grill out on the, the uh, you know, deck there. And no matter how many times you tell him, Seamus, you don't want to climb up there because blah, blah, blah. They don't hear it. But when he climbed up a few weeks ago and he put his hand on a 500 degree grill, Ooh. I guarantee you, that pain is going to change his behaviors in the future. He's not going to do that again. <laughs> oh. Hey, do, they, do you got to learn the hard way? Oh, no. no I you didn't have to learn it again. To, um, let me tell you a secret about burns. All you have to do is wrap the hand, whatever, wherever the burn is, very tightly with tape. I'm not talking like Band-Aids. I'm talking like tape. And it will stop the oxygenation and you will not even have a burn. It works brilliantly. I did that. Wow. I, I had taken a cast iron skillet out of the oven, like a hot yeah. oven, and put it on the stove and forgot that it had been in the oven and went and grabbed the thing. But my mother told me this years ago. So I just went and I got just regular tape and, and did this. And it, it works every time. You just wrap it. Now what happens is the burn will, will hurt and then it will subside and it will hurt and subside. And over a few hours time, it will be less and less and less and less. I took the tape off the next morning and my hand looked just like that. Wow. wow. I wonder if it works on sunburn too. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Taping over your shoulders. I want to talk about this because it's my, my go-to thing when people have like PTSD or trauma from like one incident. Um, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times before, but tapping or it's called EFT, emotional freedom technique. And the person that I learned this from, she was a psychotherapist and she had used psychotherapy with her patients for decades. She was a very well-established practitioner in Connecticut. And then the Newton town shooting, uh, Newton school shooting happened, which was the tragedy in Newton, Connecticut, where all the, the toddlers were killed in a school shooting. It was awful. Um, so she volunteered to help out the kids there and she didn't have a lot of time because she had a busy schedule herself. So she said, what was, you know, what could be the most effective thing in the least amount of time I could do for the families of the victims, the siblings and the parents. And she only used um, tapping with them. And she found it so effective for the families that she never went back to psychotherapy. The only, she just carried forward using tap, tapping in her practice um but can you, demonstrate? can you demonstrate it yeah so it's it's actually really powerful acupuncture points so the first point is small intestine three i think about these points and sort of why they work um it's this is like a right on the side of your hand underneath the um pink, the knuckle of your pinky there or the, um but you just kind of like tap it like this and you usually start with an affirmation like even though public speaking gets me incredibly stressed out, or even though I get road rage when I drive in my vehicle, I completely love and accept myself. So you kind of start out with that. And then you go through the point. So the next point is do 20. And this, um, this uh, maybe I'll talk about the points afterwards, but then you kind of go through it. So even though when I get in my vehicle, I get mad even before someone cuts me off and, and then you keep going. The next one's above the eye. And, I f and then you talk about how it makes you feel in your body. So I feel this heat coming up or I feel the, the rage start to form and my eyes get bigger and I start to you know, do whatever. And then you keep going and you just talk about it. And maybe you talk about an incident where this happened to you in detail. 
and Cassandra cut me off and I knew it was her and I'm really mad about it and I yelled at her and I want to do this and you just kind of like talk about it so it's all this mental stuff that is going on in your head that stresses you out and then the next point is like um right in here and then um and then you can go back and there's different variations of it some of the extra points and then you just kind of keep going back and and after you kind of go through the whole thing you check in with yourself and you say like how how you kind of rate in your body how you're feeling it's good to check in before you do it and after you do it to kind of compare but you see a lot of people doing this in airports and after you've done it a few times it kind of trains your system and once you start doing this it's kind of all you need and you'll see people with fear of flying just do this you know in the airport i love it because it's free it's really effective and it's extremely simple you know, it reminds me of the healing codes we talked about before with those yeah. positions. We talked about the similarity. And again, going back to the point of it's not like psychoanalyzing everything and taking all the stuff out of the closet and like trying to deal with it and think it all out. If I could just figure this out in my mind, I'd be okay. It's kind of like not doing that. It's a, doing these things that allow you to kind of just let that stuff evaporate. Move it through, right. Yeah. yeah. Give it exit points too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have like, um, well, I could probably even find it online, but if you have like any kind of a easy reference for that, because I think that is such great information. It, yeah. Again, like you say, it's something people can just do at home. They can do it whenever it costs nothing. Um, it yeah. doesn't require the help of another person or anything. It's just, yeah. And nobody has to know you're even doing it. You know, you can do it really discreetly and it's no big deal. Um, but yeah, some of the points I've thought about, like a uh, small intestine three, small intestine um, separates the clear from the turbid. It's about like sorting. So like processing things in your mind. So it's like cl clarity. And then you're raising the clear yang. So this is going to get your nervous system on board and kind of like get things clear. And then this is a bladder point. Um, it's uh, points around the eye are good for vision. So like maybe a new vision of where you're going. And I don't know, I, can, I just kind of think about this stuff. Lungs, so you're opening, this is like grief, opening up the chest to breathe. Um, spleen 21 is an exit point um, of the spleen. It's good for pain all over the body. So it's, it, there's so many connections in that point that it just kind of gets everything. Really? Uh, for pain? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This when you, when are you gonna do a class, Allison? Muscle yeah. pain, yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. That is so fibromyalgia so type, like muscle pain mostly. The spleen, so digestive muscle. Yeah, lots of cool stuff. And then SI eighteen is uh, this is a different style that I'm learning. Um, and he talks about uh, Dr. Dung is the style, and this is a extremely powerful point for the kidneys and the. Um, the, seven, the seminar that I'm watching from the practitioner teaching this style, he's saying he gave the story about this patient with kidney stones and he did this point. And in one treatment, she was, the patient was so angry with him because that evening she passed all yes, of her kidney stones. Stone. <laughs> yeah. And that's not pleasant. It's right. <laughs> he's like, well, it works. <laughs> yeah. But so and uh, that makes sense for uh, stress because the uh, trauma affects the kidneys. That's the, it's like your deepest level and it's the spine. That, I don't know. That's really cool that you say, you say those kinds of things like, you know, and talking yourself through and, but acknowledging, you know, what frustrates you and the gift of it. It seems like there's points for both of those. And it's it's cool because that piggy, piggybacks with what we work with. Um, with every tension um, phase, there's five phases of tension that people hold in the body. And um, there is a gift and a challenge to each phase. So, you know, um, let's say phase two, just it, it doesn't matter what it is, but if someone has a lot of tension in their upper cervical, and we're working that particular area, that's usually a tension pattern with lack, less, and scarcity of time and resources. If the tension is more in the lower part of the neck, it is lack, less, and re um, scarcity with um, relationships, like your issues with relationships. 
So we, we recognize that. So I can say things to people like, so, or time and money, time and money is up here. And so I'm like, so I could ask certain questions, not knowing anything about a person's situation. They'll be like, how do you know that? I'm like, well, your tension's up here and it's indicating that, you know, time and money are kind of a concern for you right now. And they're like, that is so crazy. I've told people about them not knowing anything about them. And, um, and when I work, uh, my intention working with someone, so I understand time and money is a tension pattern up here. So as I set an intention and my objective to seeing what shifts for the person is to be like more resource and time more flexibility and openness with money. I, I set my intention to helping their body feel ease with both of those things. And usually situations tend to change, especially like with relationships, like the lower cervical relationships, um, you know, are, it sounds like, cause people ask, well, what phase was I today? Cause some people know a little bit about it. And I was like, well, it sounds like, or seems like there might be something going on in some form of relationship, whether it's intimate, work, family, doesn't matter what it is. It sounds like there's something going on. They're like, yeah, I had a big blowout with my coworkers yesterday or something like that. And they're like, how do you know? I'm like, it's just your body, your body tells you everything, you know, and that's what we're trained to look at. And it's really cool to help bring the gift of that, that security with with like the relationships or your hips. If there's tension in the hips, it usually has something to do with identity. And someone's like, yeah, I was not sure how I was gonna do this presentation or I'm my family shifting, you know, things going on with their own identity. And then just bringing, I know who I am. I know where I stand. This is me and my intention and my energy, if you will, is gonna be on the confidence and so of self. And so, and it works through all the different phases. So if if, Becky, if you ever were hear me and I'm muttering, I'm muttering my intention for that person on the table. Mutter, mutter away. Mutter away. Mutter, you're a mutter. <laughs> <clears throat> That's really cool. You know, I, I've always said to my clients, well, many years in practice, the body never lies. Mm -hmm. You can have a story about, oh, when somebody comes in, I know Matt and Tisa know this, when they lay on your table, and they're and you're like, oh, you know, if you ask them how it's going, oh, everything's going really great, and you feel their spine, it's like, well, you know, warped up. It's like, yeah, that's not what your body's telling me. And then if you sort of delve in a little deeper, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I have had some stress. So, so, so do people need to be worried that you know you're going to know more about them than you should? Like, you? <laughs> we don't know specifics. No specifics. <laughs> not specifics. It's kind of like a, I don't want to know. I don't need to know because whatever's going on in the system, you know, it has its resolution baked in. You know, it's like, and at the same time, those things that we do know, it's like it's on such a profound level of just a human to human, like soul to soul connection in that moment, whatever that might mean for you. It's just like oh my gosh, like I totally get it. Like I have been there, you know, that's when those things will translate. It's, it's that knowing of like, yep, I totally understand. So in, in a couple of minutes we have um, left, I want to make sure we wrapped up a couple of things. And, and um, I think, you know, the overall theme that I'm getting and I'm hearing from everyone is there's a lot of different windows in, a lot of different ways that we can be proactive, whether it's being present, whether it's you know, receiving some care in, in a program like Dr. Dr. Zabatelli, or working on your nutrition and, you know, working with a, a nutritional practitioner, or even I'm sure balancing your energy on the front end. We, people always, you know, bottom line is most people come to us after they've already had stuff going on, right? That's just the way it is, right? Every once in a while, somebody shows up and says, hey, I just want to be proactive. And I'm like, really? Wow, awesome. But if you can do that, it's a great thing. It's really, you, you, you're, it's like you're putting money in the bank. It's like you're creating a a store up of, of good um, connection and energy and, and clarity in your body. And it just helps you. And so there's a lot of ways you can approach that. You just have to figure out what's, you know, makes sense to you, what's comfortable to you, the practitioner you want to work with, but you know, you can do this. You don't have to wait until you're falling apart. And um, I guess also we are, uh, we didn't talk too much about this, but I know I'm going to be traveling the next couple of weeks. We were talking about maybe, um, are we, what's our schedule coming up? Does anybody? Well, I think, Jean, you, you and I talked about, um, and because I know uh, Matt and Tisa have, have things going on, so we didn't know if maybe just for August, maybe not doing this for the next couple of Fridays. I don't know how that is with all of you, but with 
some are kind of winding down and all of us with different schedules. Uh, so if that seems um, good with you, we were just going to take a little bit of a hiatus and, and regroup in a few weeks. Yeah. I want to give a, a quick uh, plug in for the videos that um, you, Becky, and Dr. Jean are doing. They're fantastic. The ones about, you know, your, your medical freedom. If you guys haven't checked those out, definitely check those out. Thank you. Yeah, go to Proactive uh, Mananuk um, Natural Health, Jean's uh, Facebook page, and you can pick those up there. Yeah. Or you can find them on Wondrous Roots Facebook yeah, page yeah. as well. It's all the same thing. Yep, we're all out there. So um, I thoroughly enjoyed this with everyone. I have a Matt Tisa and Alice. And if you want to hang on for a second, I wanted to ask you something after. So do I get to leave then? No, you could stay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave. <laughs> Becky. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, yeah. So. I guess that's it. We'll, we'll end the meeting now, and um, we could just stay on for us. Well, thanks Have a so great much. Week, everyone. We'll, we'll, we'll see you uh, starting in back in September.